Uh, just to say, I came up with this fun title before I'd written the talk. And so I realized I'd have to crowbar some Holy Grail references in. So uh, bear with me. Um, you'll probably see those moments where that happens. And also I got a little carried away with uh, PowerPoint design ideas, which you might also see. Anyway, so my talk this evening is around the mindset that one should have in the world of Agile. What metrics should we be monitoring in terms of performance and how we actually pull all of this together so that we have flow, we have good communication and organization so that everyone can reach their holy grail. Thank you. Okay, so who am I? Um, so my name is Stuart Griffith. I started off as a computer scientist. I was a coder for about 15 years. Um, I was, and that was mainly as a um, contractor moving around a lot. I was a project manager in the good old days of Waterfall. Um, I've done a lot of work with startups. So I think I actually did my first startup where I was a founder in the year 2000. That was for an exercise startup that would create a bespoke exercise program for you, which looking back, I think we were probably about 15 years too early to market. Um, but I've also coached a number of startups. Um, I personally am an agile coach. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do one-to-many coaching. Uh, I'm a trainer. Um, so I give training around different ideas, product, product management, product ownership, um, being a scrum master part-time DJ. Uh, I'm a Safe 5 program consultant, which I will talk about as part of this talk. And also I'm a student. And I say that because I'm a lifelong learner. It's one of the things that I've had to buy into in terms of that there is never a point where you know everything. And because we're in such a volatile world, it will keep changing. So we are now lifelong learners. Some logos of companies I've done work for over the years. Um, I think one of the ones I would like to call out is a company called Radtac. They were the people that gave me my safe training. They give an amazing amount of uh, support to me. I am not an employee. I am an associate of theirs, but in terms of their brilliant training and the thinking that comes out of there, um, it's an amazing place. So, Moving on, so I'm a trainer and a coach, which means, you know, unlike your mum, your dad, your boss, I can't tell you what to do. I have to persuade you. I have to show you the benefits of um, the work that we're doing. It's not about command and control, although I see that a lot in organizations. So Robert Greenleaf um, wrote an article in 1970 about the fact the servant, um, the servant as the leader. And and so it is not new thinking. Um, I think that it's really important that the servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. It's not about command and control. It's very important. And so when I think about what I'm trying to do um, as a trainer and a coach, one of the things I'm trying to do is that when I go into an organization is how do I get to the truth? How do I find out happening within an organization and it's the same for if you're starting a new organization you're inside an organization that you feel you know well because things continuously change you have to keep digging for the truth because it's an endlessly moving target and so this comes down to trust openness funding the things we always talk about but i want to say that it's really important because this is around having lots of positions caring about people if i need to know the truth then you need to trust me otherwise you're not going to tell me what's going on and if i don't know what's going on i can't because not the true real so you have to care about the people how are the people doing what are their challenges are they actually enjoying their work what kind of future would they like to see run is it collegiate does it allow for conversation and the other thing is always to be aware that in an organization I've gone into, I am not the expert. I do not understand the work they are doing. I'm looking at the network and how that evolves. 
So this slide here, so off of a huge year, um, this is Dean Leffingwell, one of the founders of the SAVE framework. And we're talking about the fact that in this modern day and age, we are talking about this not how to be agile, how to make the whole business agile, because it needs to adjust to the changing boundings. So it's about business agility, and we're entering the age of software. This is the world we're now in. So if we look at some of the things that are going on in different stations, so BMW, they that half of their R&D staff will be software developers in the next two or three years. That's the shift. You look at the cap of Tesla, which is a much higher towards, even though the revenue is on in terms of the value. We see that Apple is now the biggest watchmaker in the world. Who saw that coming? What we're seeing is that if you are very good at creating software and having agile mindset, you can go to different industries and you can disrupt much more effectively than people in those software developers and software houses. It's changing. And the problem that we have, as Dean Leffenwell was talking about, is that in the next decade, we could end up, all of us, working for 10 billionaires. And they just take over all industries. And no one wants, no one should have that concentration of power. And you start to see the strange effects. So Elon Musk was asked not to actually, and two days ago, he said, actually, I will. And I don't care, come and arrest me. And I can't touch him. You look at... Uh, with the Googles, the Facebooks, who are saying, Amazon, yeah, we won't pay tax. And there's nothing you can do. The only way we can fight back is we, oh, we have to treat like them. So the how this evolves, the big parts is it comes from a network. All start up, have a network of people working together. They... So the titles, they're just getting stuff done. Innovation's really quick. And we, you know, space, but it's amazing how quickly you can stun. Then at time as you grow, the hierarchies come in. Stabilize and that your operations, so you can, the hierarchies have value. Who over time is they crush innovation. So one of the ideas that came out in far is to talk about the notion of separating the two. Right? So you have your hierarchies, they stabilize, they are providing the money, the products that are keeping you going. But ultimately, we actually really need to the networks. How can we move them around so that they are delivering on new value or new potential value? Because that's how the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons work. Right. By the time we're thinking that the stories in our Facebook feed are interesting, they've moved on. They're developing something else. They recreate their networks. And that's how you continually adapt your business to deliver value. So this is the safe framework picture. And I remember the first time I saw this, I found it terrifying because there's a lot going on. So I'm going to show you a quick picture of my cat, Stanley. I find, uh, I find him wonderfully soothing. Okay, right, we're going to go back in. So in terms of this framework, some of the stuff we're talking about, let me just take you through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down really quickly. I could talk about this for days. But what we're looking at is here, these are the teams. So these are your agile teams. We've got product owner, scrum master, the developers, whether you're doing hardware, software, firmware, doesn't matter you have a team of people that are working to deliver some value and then in safe you know we can be using scrum we can be using kanban both of them are valid we keep the customer centric as everyone should be now and we're thinking about design thinking how are we bring in innovative thought and then what we say is to be doing safe we have to release an agile release train so it's an art and what that is, is five to 10 teams working together to deliver value. And during that, it's through a phase of about three months and people think, oh, so you just do 
project plan for those three months and that's not true as part of this process we are doing continuous exploration how can we innovate how can we deliver in better ways do we understand the nature of the problem how we're trying to solve it how are we integrating all our work we could have on this agile release train 50 to 125 people how do we pull that work together how do we make sure it's risk-free how do we ensure quality is there how do we get it out the door and how do we then release it to our customers because until everything we're trying to do is ultimately a hypothesis until our customers have it in their hand they're giving us feedback then we look at this large solution level what this is saying is okay we have an agile release train but actually we're building something so complex so think of lockheed martin nasa phillips sony really big organizations so what we would say is okay there's a solution train and it has multiple trains on it and all of them are trying to deliver value so in terms of give me an understanding because i know that people when they think about safe side there's a lot of overheads it's a lot of hierarchy it's too complex but let me give you a flavor of the scale of this so i was with an organization who make mri scanners which means at a team level the place where they just make the magnet that goes inside the MRI scanner, there are, there's an agile release train, there's all the people that build it, there's all the support staff, the third party suppliers. And at that point, just managing and supporting this, you're looking to four figures in terms of people. Then you move up to the large solution. So I was working with a group of people where we deliver that magnet to someone, and then who does the casing? Who does the bed you slide in on? Who actually builds the panels where you control it? Who does the analysis? Who actually puts it into place? Who are all of their suppliers? And you can easily get into five figures for the number of people that are working to deliver products. And so at that point, how on earth do you coordinate? That is what SAFE is trying to do. It's trying to enable the conversation so that if in England here, I make a software change, and on the other side of the planet, someone's making a hardware change and they need to be able to talk to each other. How do we enable that communication? This is a lot of what this is trying to do, okay? How do we actually get rid of siloed thinking? And then ultimately at the top of the organization, what, what's your strategy? What's your vision for the organization? From your vision, how are you coming up with multiple value streams of what you're delivering to the end user? because you're going to have some products that are mature in market. You're going to be trying out new innovative ideas. You've got your horizon planning on where things are. So even when a product dies, there's still a cost to that. So how are you slicing up your budgets? Where's the money going? How are you managing five figure number of people who are trying to communicate and deliver this value? Where's the strategy that oversees that? Now in safe, you don't have to be doing all of it. You could just be doing this bottom section over here. But here, this is for very large solutions and then for portfolio. So, okay, it's a framework, it's a process. And the problems that you would see in small scrum just scale up and just get more complex depending on the size of your organization. So allow me to say any framework can fail. Right? I'm not saying that if you put safe in it will work, it doesn't work like that. Um, scrum at scale doesn't work like that. Less doesn't work like that, neither does that. And these are all things that should, in theory, scale. So we actually have to come back to what's your mindset. You have to shift how you think about problem solving, including the leadership. Too many times I go into an organization where the leaders say, everyone else will change, but we're going to do what we've been doing forever. And that means it's going to completely undermine the change and the agile thinking we're trying to put in place. I ask teams, if you have a project plan, you've got a nice little Gantt chart, how many times has that been accurate? And the answer is always never. We look at who created Waterfall, first coined by Winston Royce in 1970 in an article. And he, at the time, 50 years ago, said, you shouldn't use this for doing software development because you'll find out too late whether you're developing the right thing. We always knew it and we still try and do it in that way. So in terms of the mindset, here are the questions you need to ask yourself. Have you taken the Agile Manifesto to heart? SAFE has principles that build on that. Have you embodied them so that you're changing the way you think? Do you understand what is in front of you and why you're making your choices? 
do you understand what lean thinking is in terms of just doing the minimum that proves whether you should be going down that path and getting the value to the customer as fast as possible? Is the customer at the center of it all? And one of the things that I think is most important is, do you know what you should not be doing? Because that is getting in the way of releasing the value the customers actually want. So we look at leadership and uh, Indy here, he's battled through loads of trials and tribulations to get to the final point where he's gonna find the Holy Grail. His dad's outside, he's been injured. And this is when you find leadership wanders in They've done none of the work, they've looked at none of the detail, but they know better. They come in, they make a choice, and they make the wrong choice because they're not relying on their network of experts who actually do the work. I see this so much. So I find it interesting when I go into an organization and say, what is the purpose of your organization? Why are you here? What's driving, what's your story that other people can get behind? What's the common vision that holds everyone together? It's quite amazing if you took a moment or you asked someone tomorrow in your organization, why are we here? There's such a variance in thought that means that you don't have a commonality of why you're driving to achieve something, okay? The, the most important thing in, for leadership is to articulate the why get out of the way of the people who are trying to deliver the how. If you're achieving that, you're doing okay. So here are a few, a few examples of how leaders can be. And so you get on the left-hand side, they're the more command and control, through to the right where they're the more the, the agile, the empowering. And I'm sure we if you look at that, you can work out where different people in your organization who are leading actually fit. And so some of the things that it's really important to look at when looking at leaders is authenticity. Are leaders walking the walk? Do they have integrity, transparency, honesty? Do they have emotional intelligence? Because if you're trying to lead a group of people where there are problems and conflict, if you, if, you don't, if you can't motivate them, if you're not empathic, if you don't have social skills, that makes it very hard for you to connect and lead those people. Do you embody lifelong learning? Is that something that the whole organization says, yes, we need to learn more to get better? Are you growing people? Are you allowing decentralized decision-making to happen because the people closest to the work have the ability to make the best decisions? If they have to wait for you every time, you are a blocker and you are adding no value. Get out of the way. And then we can look at, okay, how could you lead change? So Dr. John Picotta came up with a process that's embedded into a lot of the how we would implement SAFE. And it's around, okay, why do we need to do this? Well, actually, if you get complacent as an organization, judging that the time organizations exist is getting smaller and smaller, then you have to be worried that you're already under attack from your, by your competitors. So who do we need in the organization? Where are our change agents that we can pull together that are a coalition that can help foster that kind of thinking in the organization? Where's the vision? Where's the strategy? How do you drive that out within the organization, get people to buy into it? How do you get some wins to show that you're actually making the right choices so that you can take off with this change you're trying to achieve? So one of the things that SAFE does is there's the framework, the big picture, which I showed you earlier, but actually there's another view of the same, which is looking at seven core competencies. So here's the team and the team of teams all working together on quality. Here's the continuous learning. Here's leadership, right? We can see all of those there. And then underneath each one, there are then 21 competencies. And the question you have to ask yourself is, if you're not measuring things, how do you know you're getting better? If I'm doing exercise, I measure my performance so I can then judge whether I'm actually getting fitter. And the same is still true. So you should be doing assessments. This is one from SAFE. You can choose one from anywhere if it's relevant to your business. But the, the SAFE one is looking at overall business agility. So how are the teams doing? How do we feel quality is in our organization? 
Do we, are we actually looking at all the governance, the strategy? Do we think it's working for us? Getting a lot of people to actually fill this out, you get really surprising results in terms of where the organization is. And then you can get individual teams to also do their take on how the teams are working and the wider team of teams over here. So they can look at their sections and give you feedback. And it's really interesting to see whether the management view is actually matching the workers view. And then from there, we look at, okay, we understand where the business is. We'll come back and revisit that and measure that over time to see whether we're improving things. But let's look at flow. How are we getting stuff done in the organization? So most types of work, this again is coming out from Dr. Mick Kirsten uh, with a new flow framework he's looking at, at the moment. So most work comes into four areas, features, new, new, new bits of functionality for the end user, defects, problems the end users are having in using your product that we're going to fix. Debt. So how are we looking at our software architecture, operational infrastructure? Because the way we build something today is probably not the way we build it in two years. So if you've still got those systems in place, how are we upgrading them? How is that going to slow us down over time? And then risk is looking at security, privilege, uh, privacy and compliance. Okay, so we've got a flow framework. So what, what kind of things do we need to be monitoring to see how we're actually performing over time? So one of the first things is flow time. Again, the thing I always ask teams, it's amazing how blank people can look. How long does it take you from we have a good idea to we're getting feedback from our customers? How long does it take? I've been into really big organizations where the answer to that question could be oh, about 18 months. I mean, if it's taking that long to get any feedback, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised well over 90% of projects will fail because by the time it gets out there, you're too late. So then we look at flow distribution. What are your priorities? Out of those four types of work, what is the most important thing for you to do? People always want new features, but if you're not dealing with technical debt and you're not dealing with privacy or security issues, then that may come back to haunt you. You have to be doing a mixture of all of it. Flow load, manage your queues. How much work do you have concurrently going on? And is that slowing you down from getting stuff into the done column? Whenever I look at a Kanban board, whenever I see there's a lot of work in progress, but hardly anything's in done, I talk to people and they say, oh, we're 99% done. 99% means it's still not done which means we can't give it to the customer, which means we can't release value. We have to get things completed. So you've got to make sure you're not overloading your teams. It will slow things down. Flow efficiency. So this is looking at systems thinking. So from the point where you start work to you finish it, where are the bottlenecks? Where are the wait times? So you look at the fact that in terms of, if I look at something like we did some design and then I gave it over to the development team and someone had to chop it up into HTML. Very simple idea. So the design gets signed off and then it sits there in the queue for eight days before the team actually starts work on it. And then if you measure the amount of time that you're actually doing work against how long you're waiting for work to start, if you are getting an efficiency of five to 15%, that's perfectly normal. It means you're very slow. If you're getting about 40%, that's incredible. And then flow velocity, how many, how many things did you get done? Was it the amount you were thought you were gonna get done? What does that mean for where you're trying to get to and how you're releasing value? And then the final thing is celebrate success. Sometimes people, they forget to do that, right? If, if you've achieved a milestone, if you have got individuals, teams, they're doing better, the communication's better, your, your place in the marketplace is growing, celebrate it all. Foster that community where success is something that we just do. We're used to it. It's how we roll, okay? And one of the other things is never be afraid to overthank people, okay? They always appreciate it. And then, one of the final things I wanted to say was, there was a phrase that said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We've been attributing to that one, so that to someone who apparently actually never said it. But what does that mean? So it means that if you've got the best strategy in the world, but your teams are not working, 
together well and they're not able to deliver, you're going to fail. Don't care how good your strategy is. But if you can get your teams working well together, even without the best strategy, if you are flexible with your thinking and you learn as you go, you can make it. That's the path that can take you to success. And if all of that is working, you have flow, one day your organisation might be able to reach out and find its holy grail. So thank you for listening to me. Um, my name is Stuart Griffith. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, I'd just again like to thank Remote Agile London, um, Oliver Barnard, Alex, for all the good work they do supporting all of us. And again, Radtac, Again, I'm not an employer, I'm an associate, but they do amazing training work and I'm proud to be associated with them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much and for your kind words. Uh, we do try. Okay. Uh, oh, and also apologies to everyone for my uh, connection issues at the beginning. Thanks to my... Uh, uh, colleague Sina for stepping in and picking up the rope. So I'm now going to hand you over to Ben Maynard and his talk is how product ownership can kill agile at scale. Over to you Ben. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Um, as you have heard my name is Ben Maynard. I'll show a nice little graphic there that creeps up. Um, I'm here to talk about how product ownership can kill agile at scale. Now this has come from a uh, kind of a long, a long experience in uh, adopting large-scale Scrum in a number of different organisations, um, and kind of the, the, the pitfalls that I've seen when people try and use Scrum properly um, with multiple teams. Um, but we'll also cover a few other little areas here and there, um, and I'm happy to field questions at the end. Um, so please do put them in the chat window um, and let me kind of challenge me, come up with any any difficult question you like. So. Uh, without any further ado, let's, uh, let's begin this. So, um, as I said, my name is Ben Maynard. I'm a large-scale Scrum trainer, and I think one of the only certified large-scale Scrum coaches in the UK. Um, the large-scale Scrum community isn't, isn't big, but the people that are part of the community are fantastic. Um, so if you haven't looked at large-scale Scrum, please drop me a line, and I can point you in the direction of some things that maybe you find interesting. And the talk today does kind of focus around what, we, what we've been able to prove um, works and doesn't work when you're doing Scrum at scale. So a little bit of data to begin with. Um, I was looking at the State of Agile survey from last year, and first of all, I was really shocked that this the um, how few people seem to complete this. I, I thought it was much more, but only 1,300 people um, were responded to the State of Agile survey last year. And out of those, only 6% were product owners or project managers, which I found very interesting. You know, that's a, it's an incredibly small number, and that's either very, very uh, heartwarming because it means that people are really paying attention and they're, they're doing what Scrum says, which is to have a single product owner per product. Um, or um, that the product owners just can't be bothered to fill in a survey. I'm not sure what it means. Um, what I found interesting was that people say that one of the main reasons that they choose Agile is for increased Agile and business IT alignment. 64% of the respondents said that the reason their organization is looking at Agile is to get better alignment. Um, and I see that the, the product owner role, um, particularly in working at scale, should help to achieve that. But interesting, conversely, it also says that even though people are really going for this, uh, choosing Agile as a mechanism to achieve their mean, achieve their ends, 32% say that the, the, one of the major challenges that they face is because it's a lack of product owner or business uh, or customer that causes them to really struggle with the adoption. So I find this paints an interesting picture, especially when it says that half of these organizations use Scrum. Um, but then also what doesn't make much sense really is that half the organizations use Scrum, um, but only 3% of them use less. And less is the only framework which is actually true to Scrum. So I think this data is interesting because it shows a very confusing picture of the state of the landscape at the moment. But what I want to really focus on is how does product ownership really kind of kill hopes and dreams of achieving a scaled, a scaled agile? How does it get in the way? And what are some of the prime anti-patterns that we see? And what are some tips to help work around them? 
So I'll begin uh, giving a little overview of some of the problems that are quite common that people find when you, with product over with using Agile at scale, and particularly Scrum. I will look at uh, a problem of when the product owner is the boss. So when you're in a hierarchical situation and the product owner is the boss of either sub product owners or other people and the problems that that may cause. We'll look at dependencies, uh, dependencies of a scourge of many organizations and Scrum should help you resolve those. Agile should help you resolve those, eradicate them even. Um, but that often doesn't happen. And this can really, really hinder the, an organization's ability to flex and change based upon demand. So we'll look at how dependencies, which a product owner should be in a position to eradicate, um, can cause a lot of these problems and some ideas there. And then finally, um, and perhaps most importantly, one of the best ways that product ownership can kill any dreams of, of, of successful, um, enjoyable, scaled agile is by not building and maintaining the correct relationships. So, whenever an organization chooses uh, to get larger, right, when you're starting with a small number of teams and then you want to double or triple or quadruple that number of teams, then you are going to end up creating new problems to solve. It's difficult to, in, to have increasing numbers of teams and not create extra problems alongside that. Now with this increased need to get bigger, to have more teams, to increase your throughput, then comes the, um, the role of product owner becomes much more amplified. And the role of product owner should be something which is very rewarding for individuals and for organizations, but often that ends up not being the case. Because when it's not executed correctly or properly, and when it's not supported adequately, it can really kill all dreams of making things successful. So the problems. What problems come about then? If you've got a product owner, and let's say that you start off with two teams and the product owner is serving two teams, and then you're still working on one product, and somehow you end up with 80 teams and say 60 product owners. If you think of that scenario, what you're definitely going to see is lots of problems of coordination. Every moment that your teams, anyone is spending coordinating, then that's time not spent writing valuable software. That's time not spent with the users. So one of the problems we get with product ownership at scale, with anything, with using Agile at scale, is coordination. And that's predominantly down to the dependencies that are created. Also, when you become large, your learning ability is tough. And from a product owner perspective, one of the most difficult balances I've seen product owners have to make is the balance between earning and learning. Agility is learning. Like all of these successful frameworks are all built upon a solid basis of empirical process control, which is the kind of, which is experiential learning. It's how we get better, it's how we improve. And when you get very large and you have all these teams, as a product owner, trying to balance the needs of the, or the, the paymasters, the people who are funding the product, but then also balance the needs of the teams who still need to learn is an incredibly difficult challenge. And it's one which product owners, if, get, if they get wrong, can hinder the organization's ability to learn and grow and hinder the team's ability to pick up that next most valuable item. Now with all of this, with this coordination, with this lack of learning, this, the, the, the poor balance that is often struck becomes a redu re reduced flexibility. So even if you are able in the situation I described with your eight, 70, 80 teams and 60 product owners, even if you are able to find the single most valuable thing, because one thing, I, I mean, one thing which is, um, I think generally proven, I, I'm, I'm yet to say it disproven, is that if you've got 60, 70 lists of work, how do you find the val most valuable thing? Without creating loads of structure and roles and, and waste around, you, around your work, how do you find those most valuable things? Right? It's incredibly difficult. So even if you can find that high value item, um, the ability of your teams to then flip to a completely separate backlog under a completely separate product owner and pick that work up is limited. Now, one of the other problems is that when you're working at scale and you've got lots of, sorry, I saw a question pop up, I got distracted. Um, the problem is when you have a product owner, um, they're supposed to be a team member 
And I think that that's, that, I mean, it's, it's written in Scrum. They're part of the Scrum team. Um, I think in all the scaling frameworks, you know, that they are part of a team or at least part of the group. Um, but when you start working at scale, um, people can get delusions of grandeur. And rightfully so. Rightfully so. It's a big, important job. You've got a lot on your plate. But the problem is, is that then it's difficult to behave as a team player. And what you can end up doing as a product owner is alienating the people that you depend upon the most. The last three problems, which I'll talk about slightly more quickly. Um, here is organizational goal. The product owner's role, as well as to create a successful product uh, and see good return on investment, right? part of that role is also to support the organization's strategic direction. And this is something that people don't often talk about. But if you're working in an organization and the organization has, say, three products and, say, 400 teams, and that organization decides that the whole organization needs to go in a different direction. As, the, as the, one of the three product owners in the organization, you have to find ways to have your product support that direction. If your organization wants to change the way that things are working internally, again, you have to support that organizational direction. And that becomes much, much more difficult when you're working at scale because the stakes are higher. It's difficult to move large collections of teams in, in new directions. Um, there's also the Dunning-Kruger effect. I think it's difficult for product owners to, uh, for all of us really, to remember that we have to learn, that we don't know perhaps as much as we think we know. So even product owners working at scale still need to learn. And finally, and uh, most importantly, trust. One of the biggest problems you can get is an, an, an erosion of trust between the product owner or product owner team or product owners and the teams and the management and the users. Once this trust begins to disappear, and also, I mean, this is something I had a conversation with some people about this week, when your, when your product owners do not trust your teams, when the teams aren't creating adequate transparency or making the right things transparent that the product owners can understand, then trust is eroded. And once trust is eroded, you will go slow. Like when we have trust, we go fast. We don't need roles and policies and process. We don't need rules. We don't need checking. Right? We don't need to kind of ask the, the, the difficult probing questions to find out the information that we need. When we have trust, um, we can go fast. When we don't have trust, then we bloat out our organisations. So that's the problem, Stan. Let's look at being the boss. So when a product owner is also your boss, when they're somebody's boss, it makes things difficult. Okay, and as you scale and there's more and more people involved, um, the more difficult this conundrum becomes. So first and foremost, conflicts. So in a few of the scaling frameworks, um, the ones that go really, really look to follow Scrum, if you have sub product owners and they're working on a particular area of the product, a particular collection of customer requirements, and let's say you've got five teams working on that area, but then the product owner decides that that area, those requirements are no longer of value. There's no point investing any further in them. And that whole area, it's going to be uh, all those teams are going to be moved into, into a different area and the product owner who was looking after the area um, will, have, will still have a job but will have a different role until a new area comes about and that's a tough conversation to have with people and that can cause conflict especially when you're that person's boss so when you are responsible for that person's growth, when you know that you're going to be responsible for how much bonus that person gets for their promotion in your organization if you've made a commitment as somebody's boss to get them a promotion and then you're looking at their requirement area, their part of the product and seeing that they're no longer going to have that and that's going to affect their promotion and you're going to have to get up and fight, that's going to cause some level of internal and external conflict for a product owner. That's going to get in the way of the product owner really doing their job. Now, related to that, as I said, you've got expectations. When you are the, when you are the boss of your sub-product owners or other people within your team, there are expectations. There are expectations that go both ways. And it's a difficult thing to balance. The need for delivering the most valuable thing in the most efficient way, and the need to meet the expectations that you've set. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly for in many situations, when you're working at scale and you're a product owner and you've got tens, hundreds of teams uh, that are working off of, your, off of your product backlog. 
having to people manage people, having to look after their growth, having to do the, if you're in a large traditional hierarchical organization, having to look after their performance appraisals, their bonuses, et cetera, is very distracting. It takes time away from the role job of real product ownership. And when working at scale of product ownership, you need to have an element of focus. So these issues that I've outlined, right, these all contribute to distracting and pulling the product owner away from doing their real job, right, of, of making sure the most highest value work is always there, making sure it's at the top, right, and making sure you've got you the ability to create and destroy um, areas where teams are working so that you can always have people working on the right thing. And so all of these really contribute to making, this, making product ownership at scale a real gnarly challenge. So if your product owner is also the boss, right, keep an eye out for these things. If you're coaching that person, like, can, do consider that this is what they're probably going to be going through. Next, product breadth. Now, um, product breadth is an, is an interesting uh, concept. And what we're talking about here is how many technical components does your product have? So in a traditional kind of um, architectural based view of an organization, maybe you've got teams that work on different technical components. And within, within all those different technical components, you're going to have dependencies because when a customer comes in with a feature, their feature will probably need changes made to all of those different technical components. And if all of those technical components are seen as individual products, we have a microservice product, we have a front end product, we have a UX product, right? then those product definitions are very, very narrow. And what you'll end up with is that with that very narrow view of what you believe your product is, you'll end up knee deep in dependencies. And because you have all these dependencies and because you have all these different organizational structures, you will have a huge amount of structure, policy and process, which is then lumped on your organization, which will only slow you down. So what we're talking about when we talk about breadth of product definition is to say you define it as broadly as possible and you put in as many technical components as is feasible. Because if you don't, if you don't look to increase the breadth of your product definition to include those technical components, if you don't look to collapse in backlogs so that you have a single view, as Scrum says, for your, for your product, you have a single backlog. If you don't do that, then you end up with dependencies which cost time and money and also consume the will to live, I've found from personal experience. Um, also, if your product isn't defined broadly enough, feature teams are impossible. By strict definition, you will never have a feature team unless your product is defined broadly enough. And the litmus test for a feature team is if that team has a dependency, a technical dependency on any other team, then they cannot call themselves a feature team. If your product definition is not broad enough, you will have those dependencies. So if an organization thinks that feature teams are a way to achieve their goal, then they'll have to increase the breadth of their product definition. Now with your, you think when you're working at scale and you've got all these teams and all these different lists of work, go back to my original uh, scenario, you've got say 80 teams and 60, 70 different product owners and product backlogs, you're gonna have duplication. You're not gonna have a way of understanding what work is duplicated and where. If someone's gonna make a nice reusable part of the architecture to do a certain task, how do you get, if that's done in team two, how do you get the people in team 68 knowing that it's there? they'll go and do something similar themselves. So when your products are defined too broadly and when you're working at scale, work gets hidden. Duplication is rife. And because of that hidden work, going back to what I said earlier, understanding where the single most valuable item is becomes extraordinarily difficult. The simplest way is to maintain a single list. That's very difficult. So if you can't do that, what's the minimum number of separate views on your product backlog you can have so that you can actually still see the reality of things. Because if a product owner working at scale cannot set the direction well enough, cannot prioritize effectively and quickly, then your wish to deliver value continuously um, is gonna struggle. Uh, finally, relationships. So when we were just eight people, as a product owner, I'm talking from personal experience here, I was a 
what I would call a fake product owner for a little while. Um, I had great relationships with the team. I had great relationships with higher management. I really did. It was easy because we were small. But when we grew and we ended up getting into, you know, nearing double figures of teams, but maintaining those relationships became increasingly difficult. And because I couldn't maintain those relationships, because I couldn't continue to grow those relationships, because I couldn't keep that trust going, it made my life very, very difficult. So there are five relationships that if the product owner, when working at scale, does not focus on, right, there will be problems. I'm not saying these are problems which are going to derail the whole organization. I'm not saying they're even problems which are going to keep a product owner up at night, but they will cause problems however small. So the first relationship I put here, um, oh, and by the way, I will share all these slides with you. Um, I'll make them available for download. I'll do that now. So if you can't see and you, or you want to go back at something, there's a link in the chat. You can download these slides. Um, the first relationship is higher management. As a product owner or as a team, a collective, um, yeah, as part of the, uh, the sorry, that, uh, I can't stop looking down at the chat window. Um, you have to, as a product owner, whether you're working individually or if you're part of a product owner team or collective or group, what you have to appreciate is that there's probably going to be someone above you. And there's probably even some people in the other parts of your organization who are more senior to you that you have to build a relationship with. And you have to build these strong bonds. Because if these are the people that are funding you, if these are the people that are defining the organizational strategic direction, I think in, a, in an agile and lean world, what you would hope is that the managers, the higher management and organization are defining structure, policy, and process. And as a result of that, they're responsible for the organizational system overall. And because they're responsible for the organizational system, everybody is working within that. So if you are in charge of the direction of a product, you need to have strong relationships with these people. I'm not saying you should wine and dine them or take them out for dinner or spend a day, um, become friends with them, but you have to have a strong relationship because you have to trust them and they have to trust you. Because when working at scale, the stakes are much higher. The second relationship I'd like to raise attention to is the relationship with the Scrum Master. Uh, the Scrum Master's role has always been and will always, by, I hope, continue to be um, to coach the organization and to coach the Scrum team to help everyone on that path of continuous improvement. And the Scrum Master is included within, the, scrum, the product owner is included within that. What the Scrum Master should be doing to the product owner is helping them maximize return on investment, helping coaching them, supporting them through difficult challenges, helping them understand what servant leadership is, helping them understand um, the effect of what they're considering, helping them understand when they need to create or destroy a new area of their product for teams to work on. That's the role of a Scrum Master. The problem is in the role of a Scrum Master, I think it's often, often undervalued. Um, and often, uh, at times, um, just because of the lack of experience, people um, struggle with the role. I've always found that the Scrum Master role is at its most effective when you have somebody very senior playing that role. When you have someone very senior playing the role, it, it's easier for them to build relationships when you're working in an organization which is kind of getting over their hierarchy. Um, but regardless of all of that, the product and Scrum Master have to have to have a very strong trusting coaching relationship because a Scrum Master is there to support the product owner and always finding ways to get better. Now, the third relationship is the product owner has to have built very strong relationships with the users and customers. Now, of course, this is obvious, um, but it's worth mentioning is that the customer that the product owner has to have a good relationship with them. However, um, and I'll go on record as saying this, the product owner should not be involved in any of the detail. When working at scale, it is impossible for a true product owner to be involved in the detail. And also, and we'll come to this in a second, when a product owner is involved in the detail when working at scale, you are invalidating one of the most uh, important and pr uh, provocative and impactful agile principles, which I'll come to in a second. Now the product owner has to have a strong relationship with the teams. Um, again, there's trust. The product owner has to also under, help the team understand what transparency the product owner requires. 
the team need to have good relationship with the product owner so that they know that they can go to the product owner and ask for help. I think one of the, some of the best questions I've heard teams ask product owners are along the lines of, um, we started this piece of work, we've met Graham, he's fantastic, but we're kind of stuck. We need to, is there anyone else in that area that you can introduce us to so we can go and get more clarification on something? And then the product owner steps in, he says, yeah, of course. Like, I'm not worried, I, 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 we've got a good relationship. I know you're doing it with the right intentions. So I'll qualify, make sure that we're all sort of, the, uh, yeah, I fully understand what you mean. And I'll introduce you to John, because John's a great guy. Right. So there, there has to be a relationship between teams and the product owner, and there has to be constant attention paid to that. And now finally, and probably my favorite one out of them all, and the one I alluded to earlier, the product owner, because they can't be involved in the detail if you're following, if you're really using Scrum at scale, the product owner will be having many, many teams working from a single backlog. They won't be able to be involved in the detail. So what they have to do is get out of the way and help the business people and the developers work together on a daily basis. Now, if they can do that, then you're on the path to great things. So the fifth relationship is to say that the product owner has to focus on building the relationship between the teams and the users. When the users and the team work together, the team develop empathy for the users. The teams understand the users' needs and problems better and can come up with better technical solutions. When that relationship is there, the users they aren't afraid to give quick bits of feedback, aren't afraid to get involved with the team. And then that, that frees up the product owner to focus on setting the direction. It frees up the product owner from having to prioritize every single item in the minutia on the backlog, because a team of the users can begin to do that together, given that the product owner has set a strong, clear direction. So we've covered relationships. Now I said I wanted to give you some tips. Um, there are three tips that I'll talk about, just ever so briefly, you've got the slides, you can look at this. The three tips are, well, number one, um, define your product broadly. Contain as many technical components as is feasible within that and look to increase that over time. Okay, you'll, you'll kill dependencies, you'll begin to enable uh, feature teams, and most importantly, you'll create an organization which is better, uh, uh, better suited to adapt to change and it'll be more product and customer centric. Build up the five relationships. Now, this may feel like a game of chess at times, and there's a lot of moving parts, but if you build these five relationships, if you build trust, if you tune into people, you can achieve great things. And lastly, um, servant leadership. As a product owner and as a product owner team, you have to embrace servant leadership. This isn't something that's just for the Scrum Master. In an agile and a lean organization, this is something that is for everybody. And I think the, the more we become aware of that and the more we really think about this, about the impact of servant leadership and some of the roles that maybe people haven't considered it being a, uh, part of before, uh, we can really help to achieve some, some great things. Um, so thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Um, I can see we've got a couple more people than we started with, so I'm hoping that some people got something from that. Um, in the deck, I'm hoping they're clickable. Um, there's a, a link to join up with uh, mine and my friend, Fiddy Lander. Um, we've got a nice little uh, mailing list. We've got a little thing that we do. So feel free to sign up to the mailing list and get some of our free infographics. Um, I'm doing some large scale scrum training uh, next week and in a couple of weeks time as well. So if you're interested to learn more about less, um, there's a 15% discount code on there for you. Um, it's cheap anyway for less basics training. It's all done remotely. So you can grab yourself a bargain, come along. Um, I think we're almost sold out on the next course, but we've arranged another one for June. So please do click on the link, have a look. Um, my, my less courses, the public ones are done in conjunction with a company called Agile Center. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of. And um, that's me. Uh, I'm happy to fill some questions. Ben, thank you very much. I uh, thought that was great. Um, okay, so a couple of questions have come in. Um, so I will kick those off. So a question here to both you, Stuart and Ben. Um, so I'll just give you both a chance to answer this one. For someone new to Agile, what advice would you give them and what literature would you recommend? Go on, Stuart, you can go first. Give me time, give me time to think. Oh. Right. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me see. Um, 
I would say uh, Eric Reese's book. I think that that's always classic in terms of how to look at lean. Uh, I would also go and read Agile Manifest. So, 50 years old, it still embodies so much of the thinking that you need to do when you are trying to work out the best path forward. Um, and the other, um, oh, a really good one, great, uh, which came out at this year, a conceptual book in terms of how what kind of thinking you need to have can move your business proposition forward um i'm not in my house i've got a bookshelf of books in my house that i could just off but uh yeah <laughs> well i've just been reading my bookshelf but i couldn't find the main one i wanted um i'm a bit um I'm going to go old school a little bit to start with. Um, I think that anyone who's working in software um, should read the seminal book called The Mythical Man Month. Man Month, yeah. It's a, it's a classic. I think you can even get the text, like, just you can just download it off the internet. Um, it's, a, it's a stone cold classic. Like, it was written in the 70s. Um, nothing has changed since then. We've still got the same problems. Uh, Mythical Man Month was also one of the first, I think, times when um, Conway's Law was first mentioned it's a fantastic book um on that tip as well death march a classic by edward yorden about projects that are destined to fail no matter what you do um i'd recommend uh, as an introductory text succeeding with agile by mike cohen um very good book uh quite easy to read um the great book freedom from command and control by john seddon um he's a lean and systems thinker that's very good um and i suppose i should say that um your, your reading this wouldn't be complete um, without reading this rather awesome book, Large Scale Scrum by Craig Larman and Bosvoder. Um, you know, I think a lot, a lot of people know that you know, Craig Larman and Bosvoder, um, you know, they are the people that have done more effort than anybody to really define what Scrum is in detail and has also defined, the, defined feature teams. Um, so they're great books to get you started. And um, if anybody wants me to, do I go over those again? Just contact me via my contact details and I'll ping you over a list. Actually, that's the point. Uh, the one that I would add is one of the ones that I was mentioning in the talk, which is uh, Project to Product and um, by Mick Kirsten. And that's looking at the kind of mindset shift you have to have because I go into a lot of organisations and I meet the PO and the PO is actually a project manager. They're not acting as a product owner. And so there's a mindset shift that sometimes doesn't happen in organisations that creates bumps in the road. Thank you. Yeah, we actually had a uh, talk on Product London on Monday night. Um, it was about whether the, the product manager and project manager can coexist. Um, that, was, that was pretty interesting. OK, so another question to you both again, actually. Um, when trying to scale agile in a dogmatic environment, what advice would you give? As in, I say it's dogmatic in so much that they are dogmatically trying to, uh, against Agile or dogmatically waterfall or dogmatically Agile? I, I think the question alludes to it being sort of dogmatically waterfall. Uh, okay. Okay. Stuart, I like the fact that you, uh, you quoted Winston Royce. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of waterfall being effective and predictable, we there is so much data that proves that that is not the case. And so if I went in such an organisation, A, how come we're having the conversation? That's the first thing. Um, B, are they actually able to deliver in a predictable way? Do their project plans currently work? Otherwise, why are we having the conversation? Because I, I think there are probably problems in the organisation. So the first thing is, can we bubble them up and understand what their challenges are? Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, it's a difficult one because there is no, there is no silver bullet. Um, again, also great read by Fred Brooks. Um, but uh, I think that when you're in a very dogmatic organization and people are kind of setting their, they're really, really set in their ways, it's understanding their motivation. Like if, they're in a, if they're in a position where they, like, if, 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 people, if someone's trying to sell Agile and the organisation's pushing back, it's because they don't see that they've got a problem that Agile can solve. And you have to then consider, okay, so why, why can't they perceive as a problem or why am I perceiving as a problem? 
Um, so I think understanding people's motiva motivations, um, understanding how the top of house feel about things as well, um, sniffing around for some like seeds of people wanting to try something different at the bottom. Um, but if you, as they say in systems thinking, the harder you push against the system, the harder the system will push back. So if your organization isn't up for it and you're pushing, it will just push back twice as hard. So I think there is an element of knowing when to call it a day um, and realize that, they, that some organizations don't want to head in that direction. Um, I think all of that's very fair. I mean, I always find it interesting when an organization brings you in to talk about Agile, what prompted that moment? Are they actually at a tipping point of saying, we need to change? Or are they just trying to explore potential opportunities or different ways of working? Where are they in that process in terms of their understanding of their own organization and where they want to take it? Yeah. And yeah, I, I would agree with you. You always have to look at the leadership and what they are saying, because if they are not behind some kind of transformational change, then it will fail. Um, I just one last thing. Um, there is a nice workshop um, which I've actually, I've kind of extended it and I would say maybe improved it a little bit over the years um, called Why Agile, something that Michael Sohota put together. I've just put it in the chat window. Um, it's a nice little workshop. And the great thing about it is, is it, um, you don't have to mention Agile at all. It just gets the leadership and other people to really focus on what are their business goals? Like what is it they want to achieve? How do they want to achieve it and, and, and why? Um, so by having people focus on like the why first, of course, you know, start with why and then like what and how and then who, um, you can align people. Uh, oh, thank you, Abid. Um, you can really align people to, uh, to, on their organizational goals. And if they can then see that Agile might actually help them achieve some of their goals, then you can begin to connect some of the dots. But until you can help them see that potentially Agile is something that can help, then you're always going to be pushing against a very um, sticky door. Thank you. Ben, question to you. Um, yeah. What advice would you, I mean, that actually, this question does uh, quite nicely link to what you might have just said there. What advice would you give to build a better relationship with stakeholders and product managers in a large business? Any advice um, on that would be great. I would say um, read a book. <laughs> Um, like Humble Inquiry is a great book to understand how to build better relationships. Um, it's about knowing when, appreciating that you are dependent upon people in order to get your job done. And I think if you can get, if you can meet people and be humble and be empathetic, um, then that's a great way to start building those relationships. I would also say that, um, and this is something which I've taken from professional coaching, is that if you're, if you're trying to build relationships with people and you want to be successful in doing it, then you have to make sure that you really know yourself. Like, you have to know who you are so that you know how to be consistent with people and you can help to build trust. And then you're not going to you're not going to bend and flip based upon what people are saying. Um, yeah, you're not going to just bend to their whims or say things to appease them. You can hold firm on the things you believe and you know, you are, you know who you are and that you can listen to people, you can empathize with them, you can talk through things with them and start to build those relationships. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, relationship building. I really enjoy um, humor. I just getting to know people. And I think there is something about kind of uh, showing that you care and listening makes a huge difference when you're building relationships regardless of who it is. There was one person that I spent time with when I first started at uh, my previous employer um, who I knew that I was going to have problems with. So the first time we met up, I just listened to him for 45 minutes. I think I said about five words. Um, but then actually we ended up with a really solid relationship quite quickly. It was, it was kind of weird. Um, but it's because he was like, oh, well, hold on a minute. This guy isn't going to come in and try and tell me what to do. He isn't going to try and rip things apart. He actually just wants to listen. And that put, set us off on a great foot. So um, yeah, listening, being humble, uh, being empathetic and knowing who you are, I say are a good recipe for building those relationships. Any relationships in, in life, I guess, as well. Yeah, no, pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Not divorced yet. <laughs> <laughs> Lockdown might uh, cause a few more of those. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, guys, um, thank you very much to Ben and Stuart. Um, that's all our questions are done for this week. Um, I've said it before, um, but, you know, really, really keen to keep these meetups going. Um, as I say, we're getting some great feedback and a, a huge amount of engagement in these. Oliver Bernard runs 14 of them now. If you do want to get involved uh, host as a host company or to just become a speaker, then please do. Um, visit our communities page for the recording of this. Um, that will be up within the next 24 hours. That will give you a link to our YouTube page. Um, same time next week, well, it'll be 5.30 or 6 o'clock next week. We've got Jana Lace and Scott Seabright. And then towards the end of the month, uh, we've got Jeff Watts um, speaking at Agile London as well. So uh, look forward to some future events. Um, thank you very much for everyone for listening. And again, to Stuart and Ben with some great talks. Really appreciate it, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Have a great evening too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you.